Hello, I'm Karen Cho from CNBC. Thank you very much for joining us for Conference de Perry. Let me introduce you to your speakers today. Anne Richards, the CEO of Fidelity International, and Jean Lemire, who is the chairman of BNB Paribas. Thank you both for joining us as we talk about a world in transition. Now, when this conversation was arranged, we had dominating themes, inflation on the back of this pandemic, and climate change as we spoke about this huge transition taking place. But this is the business world, and there are fast-moving events now around the variant Omicron. We've been talking about uh, what the potential impact may be on business activity, consumption, pricing pressures, and a retreat from extraordinary monetary and fiscal stimulus. And if I can come to you first, are you worried about an economic setback from this variant? It's really too early to say, I think, that because we're still working through whether this really is a more transmissible virus, and whether if it is more transmissible, it's actually a more serious virus than the one that's already in circulation. And I think another three or four weeks, we will be able to have, we'll have much more data, which will actually tell us more, is it something that we need to be alarmed about? Or are we just in this continuing endemic stage of having to learn, both as individuals and as, a, as economies, how to, how to cope with the virus? So I think it's a little bit early to say that. But I think it has knocked in the very short term confidence because it has reminded people that we are not through this yet. And indeed, there might never be a being through this. So we might have to live with a little bit more of growing and then slowing down of activity and of mingling, frankly, as we all adapt to this new world. So I think it's you've obviously seen from the market reaction. I think there is clearly in the very, very short term. Um, an, an increased lack of confidence. But whether this lasts beyond the next three or four weeks, I think it's way too early to say we need the data on how the virus actually behaves. Jean, let me come to you. I was meant to be with you in Paris, but uh, here we are, disrupted travel yet again. The wheels were in motion for this economic recovery. Are you concerned that that may stall now at this point? Measures are taken quickly to protect uh, societies and people, rightly so. Remember, Two years ago, there were many criticisms about the delay before making decisions. Now decisions are made quickly by governments, by the corporate sector. We act quickly to protect. It doesn't mean that there will be a slowdown, a setback. It means simply that we need to protect people, and we do it. Uh, for the time being, what I see is a very strong rebound in the economy in Europe, very strong. Uh, fueled by uh, savings uh, people have maybe unfortunately but have made during the two last years and m my my guess is it's going to continue people will uh, use their savings to consume and even more but we may come back to this uh, when i speak with clients uh, they they are very positive and they want to invest they want to prepare the future and uh, the tone, the tone is still very positive. So, if there is uncertainty, we, we I think we know how to live through this. And uh, my, my final comment to your question: If there is a lesson we have made out of the crisis, is adaptation. We know how to adapt. We know how to deal with it. It is amazing. I think two years ago, nobody in this room would have said this. Today. We speak on the screen. We adapt. We do it. And I'm, I'm sorry you are not with me in Paris. You should be. But nevertheless, we have a dialogue. It shows how much we are able to adapt, to continue to work, to deliver, and hopefully to enjoy life, which is more difficult probably, but people do it. You make some very good points there, Jean, about a playbook around COVID and this adaptation. But I want to bring up market volatility to both of you because there still are huge unknowns here. One about transmissibility, vaccine efficacy. We've already heard Moderna weigh in and the CEO saying they may need to tweak vaccines. We don't know about the severity of symptoms here. And also, and quite important, 
how individual governments will react this time round and whether lockdowns will be required. So if we look at the market reaction so far, first up, and we've had a market sell-off, we've had a market rebound, and now we're setting up for a little bit more red on the markets. Do we have to get used to volatility now in coming weeks while we wait for answers? <laughs> I always find the volatility question a really interesting one because you know, I've been in the investing world for the best part of 30 years. And I think sort of every six months or so, somebody gets worried about volatility. And sometimes you go for a, you know, volatility is part and parcel of life. And I think that it's out there. But I think the way that I've been viewing this whole economic cycle, and I think it is maybe a little bit helpful to step back and use an analogy. I don't know if you all remember a concertina box, you know, the squeeze box that you, you hear, the musical instrument that you hear people, he, people play. And I think what has been fascinating about the last two years is that the the economic cycle has been, first of all, compressed and then stretched, and it's being compressed and stretched again. And what I mean by that is if you roll back to where we were um, when the pandemic first became, when it first became clear this was a pandemic and this was a global phenomenon, back really in March of 2020. Markets went into free fall. I mean, markets really, we had that moment of thinking, my goodness, how are we going to, how are we going to, to Jean's point about adaptation, how are we going to adapt? Do we have the facility to do it? Well, a number of things happened really, really quickly. We had unprecedented monetary policy action around the world, very quickly followed by unprecedented fiscal response. I mean, governments kicked into gear. Now, we could all argue about who did it better, who did it worse. But nonetheless, globally, we saw different measures come in, some of which were brilliantly successful, some of which maybe were a little bit less successful, but it was a time of experimentation. And then finally, the corporate sector, the corporate sector kicked in as well. So we went to this period of of everything being stretched out and not knowing what was going to happen to then suddenly everything being thrown to try and solve the problem. Markets got their confidence back. We've had in and out through that period as the different waves of the pandemic have come and gone. And then we were back into, as we came into the autumn this year, a period of where it really felt that actually we were through the worst of the economic impact. And what we were dealing with was a second order consequences, tightness in labor market, tightness in the global supply chain, inflation coming back. Now we've gone back into that period once again where we're going to have to figure out what is the adaptation that we need to do it. And so when you look at that overall cycle of things, I don't think we're any different, differently placed today than we were a few months ago. And as we wait and we get further information, we figure out the vaccine efficacy, some of this short-term volatility will gradually tease itself out. Right. But um, I'm very I much sure on, on the adaptation. Um, I'm sorry, um, can, I disagree? can I disagree with you on uh, where we are at, uh, at this point? Because it felt as though a couple of months ago, we had resumed the visibility around earnings. A lot of companies had the ability to start forecasting. They could see down the line around coming quarters. At this point, the assumptions we have on the table around earnings could amount to nothing. If we go back to some sort of extreme restrictions, then we may not have the same visibility. What do you make of those concerns? Well, I think even before the latest variant came through, um, we definitely were seeing some evidence that earnings growth was slowing. So yes, there was a bit more visibility for you know for some sectors. Actually, um, they've, they've had reasonable visibility and indeed excessive growth. You could argue through the pandemic as behaviour has changed, and we've been normalising against that. And it's true that there is um, a bit less visibility. You know, if you're in the tourist or you're in the airline sector right now, of course, there's a little bit lack of visibility. But so just as some other sectors performed pretty well through the pandemic, through the lockdown periods, and have suffered a little bit since. I suspect you'll see that again. So it may well be that leadership within the market changes. But I think one of the things that was really playing out as we went in, into, um, into this particular little period of turbulence that we've got here is that higher inflation, slowing earnings growth momentum was beginning to give people some cause for concern. I think what we've seen over the last few days has meant that monetary policy tightening is likely to be pushed out a little bit further. So in a way, I think that concern is possibly a little bit less, a little bit more diminished um, versus where we were before. So I think we're still in a mid-cycle from an earnings point of view. Uh, you know, I think, yes, this will affect visibility it, it, to some degree, but I think co- companies have got pretty good at adapting to this and they will continue you know, to, to find their way through. 
And thank you, Jean. Let me come back to you about this market volatility question, because over the course of the pandemic, we've seen that volatility has been great for some of the banks, that the trading performance has been unprecedented uh, since the start of this crisis. Do you think we've got more volatility and will that be good for bank earnings? There is volatility and there will be volatility. But I, to answer your question, I think I need to take to make two points. What about the volatility and what about the long-term trends? Because it's good to speak about volatility, but volatility doesn't mean a lot if you don't look at the trends. On volatility, of course you have volatility. If we are here today to speak the way we speak, if uh, the corporate sector continues to operate, banks are sound and so on, it's because governments and central banks have done a lot. And there is an official sector debt hanging on us. We have been protected. All of us, we have been protected by governments and central banks. And they have done a good job quickly. And of course, now they have to manage the legacy of this. And we have to manage it together. So, of course, I know your question for the next question will be what about inflation? We shall speak about this later, I think. And now let's look at the trends, the long-term trends. When I speak with clients, what do they speak about in the corporate sector? They speak mainly about preparing the future. And there are two lessons made out of the crisis by the corporate sector in Europe. We need more digital, we need more technology, we need to train people, and we need to invest. That's the first lesson. And the second lesson is a, an even stronger commitment to fighting climate change, the green economy and the uh, socially sustainable economy. That's very, very powerful in Europe. So when I speak with clients, they speak about this. They speak about how should we invest, where, when, in which technology, for which targets. And this is the driving force. So the view I have today is that we have a rebound supported and driven by consumption, but growth will continue. Uh, rebound will be shifted into net growth, and net growth will be driven by investment. Europe needs it, and corporate sector is ready for it, and there is a support from governments. So that's the long-term trends. Of course, there is volatility, but we need to look at this. And I would like to finish by one question, which is haunting more and more the European economies is the labor market. Not about the unemployed people, but the lack of skills, the lack of people. And that's the key question today. The more serious question than short-term volatility is the very long term, which is how to recruit people, how to train them, how, they, how to make them employable, to use this uh, awful word. But this is what we have to do. And this is what people look at. And I'm very humble. This is what clients tell us. Jean, can I come back at you too then? Because what we've seen in terms of crisis fighting mode, a lot of corporates were in that in the, the first number of months of the pandemic. And then it was when the, the numbers, their earnings, profits started to bounce back and they got visibility that they could really start to plan for the future and get very engaged on the climate change agenda. Are there concerns though if we're back in that fire fighting mode, if we've got a variant here that is forcing all sorts of extreme scenarios again uh, across economies and economic backdrops that are planning for the future, everything you just spoke about, does that get derailed for a number of months yet again where we go back into any form of a, a COVID pandemic uh, where we've got those restrictions, lockdowns perhaps required? The question you raise is good, but it's mainly a question for the official sector. The question is, if we still have difficulties because of the pandemic situation, Will governments continue to support the corporate sector? Will they continue to support the people? My guess is yes. But we can never be sure about this. You know, there could be debates, difficulties, tensions, limits. But they are, at least in the OECD world, uh, they have been able to do a lot. If I may add one comment, uh, I, I hope you will appreciate. Europe has been protected by the euro and by the ECB. Think of the situation of some of the countries, if we didn't have a strong central bank, extremely credible in the world, and able to expand its balance sheet 
to the limits we know. Maybe it's too big, but they have done it. And all of us, we have benefited from this. And that will not be forgotten. And of course, because it is like this, if there is a new crisis, I'm confident they will continue to support. There are limits. They haven't been reached, my guess, and they will continue to support. So we, we, need, we need to keep this in mind. Uh, uh, markets are not alone. The corporate sector is not alone. It's, if I may use that word, it's a teamwork. All of us, we operate together. We have done well, and I'm sure that if the crisis continues to be like this, societies will continue to do the same. Can I pick up on the inflation point and toss it to you, Anne? Because at this stage, we've been watching pricing pressures. It has caused uh, some very high inflation numbers that we've not seen for many years. We're told it's transitory. But if these pandemic trends continue for longer and we have unusual consumer patterns on the back of it already around this variant, you know, some experts are saying to us, well, people are just going to stay at home more potentially if there is an area of concern here. They may buy more stuff. And then if you've got more transmissibility in the supply chain, that could be impacted in terms of the amount of a production that is coming out of some areas. And then if there are fresh border closures, like we've seen in some countries, it impacts the cargo. So then we have more bottlenecks, too, in terms of that product are moving around the world. How concerned are you about higher for longer inflation because of these trends? Very, it's a very complex picture because you know, to, to 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 follow up on what you said about people, more people staying at home. Actually, they change what they buy, and there are different pressure points on different parts of the global supply chain. We've already seen a degree of adaptation of those global supply chains with some some things where they can shift, shifting to local. So I think I think it's way too early to try and predict what the impact of this new variant is going to be on all of that. There are some elements of, of clear structural inflation beginning to come in. I am of the view that the labour market um, effect is exacerbating it. And this is part of this concertina effect. It has changed people's behaviour. And I think some of that will normalise, which will over time ease some of the labour market um, tightness, which has been in part fueling that inflation um, fear. And um, I think as Jean's, the point you made earlier about the skills gap that we see in a number of major economies is a really, really deeply important part of that. And certainly as a corporate, we ourselves are thinking about what we can do to help people move more in that space. So I think that's, you know, as a, there, there are some elements which are going to be more structural. There are some elements which I think are still transitory. Um, to the point on the climate and the climate investment, there is, I think, some risk of greenflation that comes through from that to specific parts um, of, the, uh, of the overall system. But I would say that what we don't really know is how rapidly we can go down the cost curve of some of that new green technology. And so far, if you look at solar as a classic example, but there are others, so far we've exceeded expectations on how quickly we can draw that, down that, that, cost, that cost curve. So. I think, you know, I think we have to watch inflation really carefully, but I don't think we certainly feel that there are major alarm bells yet being rung on it. We have a, a little bit more time to see how some of that continues to, to tease its way, its way through the system. I think the other thing, just going back to actually to the question that you asked Sean a moment ago about um, you know, adaptation again in the wake of the, the, the pandemic and whether this, that will knock the climate off the agenda a wee bit. I think corporates learned um, a couple of things that were really very, very important, and not just corporates, actually, society more widely. The first is that unexpected things do happen. Very few people expected a global pandemic. It's here. It makes people believe, it has helped make people believe, actually, that climate change is real. And it's an immediate threat, not just a far off threat. So I think that's quite important. And I think the second point is governments, central banks and corporates responded unbelievably rapidly. So we've learned we can do things more radically and more quickly than we thought we could. So those are two things I think it's worth just remembering as we think about the climate challenge that I don't think will be deflected by the fact we're, we're dealing with the new variant in, in the short term. Jean, let me come back to you on inflation because it has been such a dominant theme on markets and you know, the central banks are holding the position. This is transitory pricing pressure. Others are concerned. Uh, they think that once you get inflation entrenched in the system, it's very hard to get rid of it. And perhaps policymakers are, 
are missing a trick this time round and that they are perhaps entering the territory of a, a policy mistake. Clearly, there are variables now with the, this new variant and what the impact could be across various populations and on pricing pressures. But what can you say about tackling inflation from here? What are the priorities? Well, I'm, I'm very careful about the word uh, inflation. Maybe because my generation remembers what is inflation. And inflation is not simply, quote unquote, cost increases. What we see today is about very serious cost increases created by bottlenecks and change of consumption. That's true. We see them more and more. But inflation is the moment these cost increases are fueled into the anticipations of the corporate sector and the people who begin to think that prices will be higher tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, and it changes their behaviors, especially on wage policies. In Europe, I think we are not yet fully there. We may not be far, but we are not fully there. We see cost increases. I share the views of the ECB that most of these increases are temporary. We know how to explain them. And we need to monitor very carefully at the beginning of next year if this creates anticipations on wages and impact on wages. We don't see this yet. But there is a third point. What is key is that everybody is convinced that the moment we see it, central banks will act. The question is that not that they acted today, but we are sure that when we see the beginning of anticipations about inflation, they act. This is a very difficult decision to make, very difficult communication. The US are more advanced on this debate than, than the ECB. But when I listen to the messages of the ECB over the last days, and it will be even more so probably in December, we begin to see a sharpened tension. We begin to see more attention. Their words and messages are becoming sharper on the question. It doesn't mean they act. It means that the message is, if it goes wrong, we shall act. That's key. Because if they don't say this, anticipations will grow, and that will create the inflation you fear and I fear. I fully agree on this. Last point, which is difficult. We see what's happening. Last week, I had discussions about inflation. Everybody was telling we need to act immediately. Okay? And then we have the new variant. And we begin to speak about slowdown. You know, is the, the central banks have to be careful about the way they do it. And we are in a world of uncertainty. Stop and go is not the, the policy of a central bank. And it would be more costly for them to uh, make uh, monetary policy tougher and then to relax it. It will be much less efficient. So we need the tool. We need their efficiency. And we need to trust them. Of course, trust is about transparency and scrutinizing bias. But if we are comfortable, we should trust them in their capacity to act decisively when needed. That's exactly my point. So inflation is not fully there yet. Anticipations are not yet there, but they, they may appear. That I agree with you. So, John, just to follow up on that and just to be clear around the ECB, you mentioned this conversation, the debate happening in December about how to wind down the 1.85 trillion euro pandemic emergency purchase program. Does that mean it's too premature at this point to be having that conversation? Should the ECB be waiting to see the impact of the variant? in coming weeks and months? Last Friday, I would have told you that the move was needed for the reasons I've just mentioned. It was a clear signal that they were monitoring the situation closely and that time was not yet for them, of course, to increase interest rates or to reduce all their programs, but to begin to act on a specific program designed to support the economy at the time of, of the pandemic. Today, let's wait. 
they have to they have to look at it carefully. I think the, the two of us, Anna and I, we say the same. You know, in in crisis time, the worst is to rush hour after hour. You know, let us take a few days. Let us wait. Let us get the views of the scientists, of of the medical sector. Then, and I'm sure we 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 still have time. We we can do it. We can do it efficiently. It's too early to say. John, thank you for that. Uh, I think we've got Anne's light back there. And Anne, let me come back to you around policy here because if, if we put uh, some. I was very worried. I, <laughs> I thought my words had. <laughs> That you had decided to disappear. <laughs> that I had dimmed the perspective. <laughs> and let me ask you when we, we talk about the central banks here, it may seem as though the Bank of England is first in the queue, then we've got the Fed and perhaps the ECB behind. What do you make of the, the pathway to exit now, the sort of conversations the central banks should be having? Should they be paused for the time being while we take stock of events around Omicron? Yeah, I mean, gosh, it's it's a difficult chair to be in right now, isn't it? Because on the one hand, worried about different elements um, overheating or inflation getting out of control. And then on the other hand, you don't want to be the central bank that repeats the mistake of the 30s or indeed more recently by tightening too rapidly too soon, because that's not a good playbook. So I do subscribe you know, strongly to this view that it is better to wait a month or two months and just be, be clear on the data path before acting. I think that is a lesser evil than acting prematurely to tighten. I, I think that's the case. And I think Governor Bailey, um, in charge of the Bank of England, I think made a very, very difficult call at the last Bank of, of England meeting when there was generally quite high expectations that the bank would move and chose not to, um, to, to some quite considerable criticism and yet I think probably on balance, people now feel that that was that caution might might well have been have been quite justified, given what's happened more recently. It is a very, very difficult balancing act. I think it is easier to rein in inflation, hard though that may be, but it is still easier to do that than to dig an economy out of a depression once you're in it. So in, on the balance of the two, I think waiting a month is the prudent thing to do um, because there's always the scope to, 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 to tighten a little faster if you need to do it. So I think I think that's the balancing act that, that, that obviously is being weighed up very, very heavily. And so far, I think the judgment of the central banks has been correct to just hold for a little longer and do the evolution out of these special measures a little slower. You can always accelerate a little faster if truly the economy is off to the races and inflation is off to the races. But we're not in that state yet. And before we move on from pricing pressures, let me just follow up around the skill shortage. I know both of you want to talk about it a little bit. And if uh, I mentioned this big title, The Future of Work, there are a couple of key uh, messages that come through over the past 12 months, one being hybrid working, remote working, another being the furlough, uh, wage pressure, getting the right people into the right jobs and increased use of automation. So how do we think about the sector now as we talk about the future of work? How do we get better skills uh, into the, the labor force? How do we ensure that companies plan around having the right level of automation and the right level of remote working? Just, just weigh in on how you're thinking about such a big theme now, which has evolved over the course of the pandemic. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll throw a couple of ideas out there, and I'm sure Jean has, has other ideas um, as well. But I think one of the things that we're having to do as a society is reevaluate what we, how we define skills. Um, in an aging society, for example, caring skills become really important. And we've seen um, challenges in healthcare systems, challenges in social care systems, in skills related to that, which perhaps we didn't necessarily view in some instances as very high skilled jobs, but actually you start to see it is a particular skill. It just doesn't happen to be a skill that you necessarily uh, learn about by sitting in a classroom at university. So I think we have to, as a, as a society, acknowledge and widen the definition of what we consider skills to be. And I think that's an important part of this. A second part is thinking about in the 50 year plus working life that we all have, the skills that we thought were relevant 50 years ago are not necessarily skills that are relevant today in many instances. And the skills that we have today are not necessarily going to be those 
that are relevant towards the end of a 50 year career, 50 years, half a century down the line. So continuous, continuous upskilling, continuous adaptation, encouraging people to think not in terms of a linear, linear career path, but actually of giving them the ability to pivot and to shift as they go through that 50 year career is as, is as important as what it is they're actually doing. The third point, and you touched on automation automation data, these are going to be very important to certain sectors, to certain uh, types of jobs. They're not necessarily relevant for the entirety of the workforce. And I think in building a balanced workforce, we really need to think about whose responsibility it is and how should those skills be targeted at the right element of the workforce. But within this wider context of, as a society, we need a huge range of skills. And we don't always value the ones actually that we found we needed, for example, in the last year or two. Jean, let me come over to you then around the future of work. How are you thinking about these big issues? And in particular, I guess, for, for your industry, addressing the, the skill shortage in future. Well, I, I think behind your question, there are a, a few points. Uh, the first one, which is not exactly your, work, your question, but which is very important today. Uh, I think. People have, rightly so, the impression to have done well over the two last years, to have uh, uh, been able to adapt, and that they have delivered. And when you look at the results of the economy, at the corporate sector, this is true. They have done well. And as a whole, the society needs, wishes to be rewarded. That's why you see, especially in Europe, uh, discussions about general wage increases in the corporate sector. And this is very difficult to differentiate. Yes, people have done well, they have adapted. So you are going to see this at the end of this year, beginning of next year, some discussions about wages with general increases because it's too difficult to differentiate. Th this is new in the wage policy over the 10 or 15 last years. This is a, a probably a short-term impact, but significant one. My, my second remark is uh, exactly the same about skills. Uh, the crisis has shown that some skills are needed. And of course, we, we have some contradiction there. We want to take pay, care about people, and but we, want, we know that we can have a world which is more uh, automatic. Uh, more technology driven. The key point is to fine tune the compromise between the two. I can speak about my industry, which is banking. In banking, some people say you can go technology, you don't need to meet people, you don't need to have staff to see people. This is not true. Some clients can live like this, but most of the clients not high-level income or high-level income. This is the same. They need contact. They need to engage. They need to speak. They need to raise questions to get comfort and answers. But it's becoming more sophisticated. And they want answers more quickly because they are used to get answers very quickly from internet. So the main training is to increase the skills of the staff, but to make a clever organization of the work between technology and people. But people are needed, I have no doubt. And I'll take another point, you know, to make a good credit assessment on a company, you need people. Artificial intelligence can help a lot, that's for sure, gathering data, but at the end of the day, it is a decision which is based on skills and experience. So people shouldn't be frightened about the fact that there will be no job, that all of this will be taken by automat, because some people are frightened by this, rightly so, I can understand it. But the consequence of this is that we need all of us to pay a lot of attention to training, to skills, uh, life. This is a lifelong uh, duty, uh, all of us we have, and this is a big impact. Now, in Europe, we continue to have, a, unfortunately, a high level of unemployment. At the same time, we have shortages. So it shows how much systems must be adapted. And this is a major challenge for the corporate sector, but also for governments. 
I think this is the key point on which government should act now in a structural way, which is to be able to improve skills of everybody. I think what's coming through in the conversation is that you both have a very clear perspective on a number of issues. So what a transition to climate change. We have seen a huge amount of uh, money motivated off the sidelines around COP26, a lot of goal setting at a, a corporate level, at a country level. But Anne, first up, what can you say about what we're witnessing around the climate agenda? And um, what are the big challenges from here? I think COP26, you know, building on the back of um, the, the, the Paris agreements, COP26 did see a step up a gear. It was, um, you know, it, I think it was a very tough set of discussions and negotiations. I'm not sure that absolutely everything was achieved that everybody hoped for, but I think we got quite a number of quite concrete plans that will certainly get us better placed to be on the right track, whether we've absolutely got onto that one and a half degree pathway, uh, limiting pathway that we all hope for. I think it's the jury's out on that, but I think we've got a commitment to up the pace of change. And I think so that is that is important. I think things like the sustainable accounting standards, for example, the GFANS initiatives about mobilising finance and the commitment from a much wider range of countries to, to do more is, is really important, whether on fossil fuels or methane. So I think there was, I think there was real progress, um, probably not enough, as I said. I think as we, as we look forward from here, the critical period we've got to think about is what are the tools and the mechanisms and the levers we need to make sure that we've not just agreed on the right end point, but that we've got the right nudges in place to help us through that transitionary period. Um, you know, one, one of the classic examples of that is this whole debate around divestment versus engagement as a classic example. What we really need to focus on is getting the carbon out of the atmosphere and simply selling it to somebody else where it's hidden from sight is not the right way to do that. And I think there is a risk that if we don't have the right incentives in place through the transitionary period, that we end up thinking that we're all doing lots of terribly good things, but actually this, the net amount of carbon in the atmosphere isn't reduced. So I think for me now, the sort of heavy weight of focus is on figuring out what else we can do to accelerate the transition and make sure that it's a just transition, make sure that the cost of that is evenly and fairly spread. And we shouldn't get it up. There will be costs to that, but the costs of not doing that will be higher. Jean, it's such a broad discussion, isn't it, as we talk about climate change, but just weigh in on this. How are you thinking about the challenges from here on the back of COP26? Well, COP26 for me is about uh, commitments which were much needed uh, by many countries because there is a need of, for, for consistency in the, in the commitment. Now, it is in practice in the making. Once more, clients are, have started doing it. They have started delivering it. We, we do it. We engage discussions with clients. We have created teams to work with them to company by company understand what should be done and finance what, what they will decide to do in order to meet, uh, to live up to their commitments. So it is in the making. Of course, there are a few things uh, we, we need. One of them is a general remark. In a net zero commitment, what is important is the zero. So it is about reducing emissions, to make it simple, it's more complicated than this, but reducing emissions and not playing, I wouldn't say playing a game, it would be rude to say this, but working around the target by selling assets to non-listed companies or by using too much carbon credits and markets. No, I understand it does exist, but to be honest and genuine, zero is the target. Zero is the goal we, we have to live up to, you know. So the, the zero question, I think in Europe, is well taken on board. Companies understand this, that they have to do it and not to go greenwashing. Because if we go greenwashing, there will be a huge backlash in society, notably from young people. They will not accept and it will be 
worse because we shall be closer to the uh, 2040 or 2050 uh, date. That's the, my, my first remark. My second remark is, of course, we continue to need a roadmap from governments. And in Europe, we need, well, we have embarked in making a taxonomy, which is not decided yet. And behind the taxonomy questions, there are serious debates about not coal, that's clear, probably not shale gas, that's clear for Europe, but behind gas and nuclear. And these are important questions. And they are not questions which are for the corporate sector, they are questions for policymakers. But they are very important questions for investors in the near future. So hopefully a clear decision will be made uh, within the EU about this question. Then we need metrics. Because the best way to avoid uh, greenwashing is transparency, disclosure, and being able to compare, and notably for investors. And the best way to do it is to have commonly agreed metrics and standards. And my, my wish today is that across the Atlantic, at least, hopefully with China, but at least across the Atlantic, we have the same standards. And we do not compete on standards, but we, we compete about delivering, uh, fighting climate change, but not the standards. And that, hopefully, there will be discussions between various entities, but notably the EU and, and the US, about common standards for 2022 or 2023. That's crucial for the future. Can I pick up on that point around I'm sure Canada standards? can help. Canada yes. can help. Uh, if we pick up on the point around common standards, I mean, if we look at uh, the situation around decisions that stretch beyond borders at this stage, we did have a movement around global corporation tax. That was a win for decision making. But we haven't had standardization when you look at the Internet. And this is one of the big future areas for the world economy. How do we then get standardization when it comes to green targets? Because, as you say, we've got countries that still want to keep on using heavy polluting industries for much longer than other countries. And in some cases, assets are being shuffled to parts of the world so they can still play catch up on development. So, Anne, do you think that standardization is going to be forthcoming anytime soon at a global level? It's interesting, actually, the reason that the web has been as successful as it has is because it was based on open standards, in fact. So although there are many different uh, communities that sit within it, arguably, um, in, in matters of actual protocols, its success is down to the fact it was quite ubiquitous because of those open standards. But that's probably a debate and a conversation for another day. I think the on a, on a more global level, I think the um, the adoption of the global accounting standards that Jean mentioned, that I mentioned, is a hugely important part in this. I think it's important we do not let perfection stand in the way of progress because we're all wrestling with imperfect data. The question is, is the data good enough to allow us to start to make certain um, decisions to avoid the risk of arbitrage? And so I think what we have to do and what policymakers and corporates need to work together on is identifying where there is the, the potential for arbitrage, for example, between privately held companies and publicly listed companies. It's really important that, that carbon disclosure standards are the same for both. It's really important that if banks have um, strictures put on them around lending to, for example, fossil fuel related companies, that other sources of potential funding, of potential debt, are also equally captured by that. So, for example, making sure that Moody's and S&P and the rating agencies who rate non-bank issuance are also applying the same types of standards that we see um, you know, the banks being, being, being pressurised to consider. So I think it's about now, in this part of this transition, transition phase, it is about identifying where those potential big arbit arbitration um, between standards, between rules are, and making sure that we, we, we look at and we find ways of ensuring that they don't deflect what we're all trying to do. John, one to you, uh, I want to ask you about the ECB and the measures they should take from here, because already there's a conversation around stress testing banks around climate change. 
At what point do you think the ECB should force banks to hold more regulatory capital because of their green exposures or, or their exposures to heavy polluters, I should say? Well, you, you know you know well the discussions. They, they are two, two potential approaches. One is about looking at the assets we have or the commitments we have made, lending to, to, to the corporate sector, and trying to measure the implicit uh, climate change risk we have. It's clear that there are some activities which are very sensitive to climate change. And of course, if we land there, we should take fully take into account the risk. So that's, I think that's the rather obvious step, which is about risk management. That's the first point, which is obvious and clear and will over time be developed with clear standards, accounting standards. Let's do it. There's a second question which is more difficult, which is, should risk-weighting assets be used to, as an incentive uh, to finance some activities and other acti not other activities? The only official uh, view I know on this question has been made about, by the British authorities. They have published a report a few days or weeks ago, and they say, no, uh, the, the uh, capital requirement system shouldn't be used as an incentive to do or not to do, but should be used, of course, for the first cause, I've, I've, I've reminded you. Uh, in my understanding, the ECB hasn't made any clear view about this. I'm sure that there is, there is a debate about this, and we shall see uh, how the debate moves forward. Uh, but the British view is very sound and clear, and they have made it simple say, yes, taking into account in the risk management, there is a risk, you must take it. An incentive is a different debate. And by the way, to have an incentive first, we should have a clear view about what is the, the uh, uh, policy mix, the energy mix governments wishes to have. Jean uh, and uh, Anne, we're pretty much out of time, but I just want to wrap up very quickly with a, a 30 second takeaway message from both of you, just to give our audience something to think about. We are a, a world in transition. Uh, that is where we are on the back of this pandemic, but uh, supersized trends we're seeing around digital, around green agenda, and also around this pandemic. And what should investors, what should people focus on for the next couple of years? Notwithstanding the challenges that we've talked about, about new variants and inflation and various other things, I've never seen the pace of innovation and that I'm seeing today. And it cuts across multiple different sectors. You can see it in life sciences. You can see it in green tech. You can see it in the way financial services is, is reinventing itself as well. And I think that is, I am, I am by nature an optimist, but I think that is hugely optimistic. We are going through a fifth industrial revolution, in my view. And the pace of this is faster than anything we've seen before in history. So I think there is a lot to get excited about because this latest crisis has really fueled humans' great gift of innovation, and we're really seeing that coming through. And Jean, 30 seconds over to you. What should investors, what should people focus on at this point? Well, I am I'm a banker. So first, uh, a banker always takes first a negative view uh, and then a positive view. Uh, the negative view is simple. The negative view is uh, we should not be, anybody should be confused by bubbles cheap money, which was needed to protect the world and to protect people, have created bubbles. And we need to be aware of this. Bubbles are not are a fact, but it's not the reality. And one day, bubbles will disappear, and that will hurt. So investors must be extremely careful about, about bubbles. I shall not mention them. You know them. There are a few we, we need to have an eye on. That's to be much aware, not to waste money and resources. The second point is, of course, to invest in technology and to trust, to trust the industry, to trust technology, and to trust the people, and do the job, and do the job when there is an income. So there are a lot of opportunities. I think this is what we have seen during the crisis. I'm, I'm sure that the 
capacity to invest in sound activities has increased over the two last years because it has open eyes, open technologies, open possibilities. So let's do it. Jean, and thank you so much for your time today. I very much appreciate you taking all the questions across a very wide uh, list of, of topics. Uh, Anne Richards, the CEO of Fidelity International, Jean Lemier, the chairman of BNP Paribas, as we kick off this conversation on world and transition for Conference to Paris. Let me hand it back over to the conference now. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much for joining this conversation.